The coronavirus is here. The crisis has arrived. What do fundraisers need to do? Hi, I'm Bill Stanjakevich. This is the first day from the fundraising school. And the first thing, of course, we want to communicate is we hope that you are healthy and doing well in your household, in your place of work. Not all of us can socially isolate if we're helping people through our nonprofit organizations. And again, we just trust you're doing the very best you can with social distancing and physical distancing during this unique time in world history. And during this time, the Fundraising School wants to be responsive through these podcasts to provide you the expertise of our faculty that you can apply to do the very best you can with fundraising during these challenging times. And of course, you need to start where you are with what you have and who you know and do the best you can knowing it is going to be a difficult time, at least in the short term, if not the long term, when we think about fundraising. My guest today is Dr. Patrick Rooney. He's been a frequent guest on these podcasts. Patrick is a national and international expert on the role of economic factors with philanthropic giving, what happens after natural disasters in philanthropic giving, and he's here today to help us summarize what can fundraisers do during this time of crisis. Patrick, thanks for being with us. Folks who watch the video frequently, we're doing our best to socially distance here as much as we can uh, as we record this podcast. So Patrick, what can fundraisers do? Yeah, so Bill, I think it's important to understand the context a little bit in terms of right now the economy is in a bit of a free fall, yeah. right? And I think it's important to just, I want to say that this is a nonpartisan, bipartisan challenge that we face and that um, both parties need to unite. This is a, a national, international crisis. And, uh, but we see this, the stock market in a free fall. And it's lost a third of its value in an, a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is truly unprecedented, uncharted territory as we've talked about. And I think for fundraisers needing, you know, they need to understand that there's a lot of uh, headwinds facing what we're you know, trying to accomplish as fundraisers. You know, first, many individuals have either lost their jobs or have lost a substantial share of their income, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you and I are fortunate, lucky, blessed to say we're still going to get paid. We're working remotely for the most part, but we're still getting paid. Um, but there's going to be a, a non-equitable distribution of this economic pain, right? right? So the parking lot attendant at the Colts games, you know, the concessionaires at the Pacers games, um, the waiters, wait staff, uh, waitresses at bars, uh, pizzerias, restaurants, they're all going to be effectively unemployed or you know, nearly totally unemployed. Right. So their income is going to plummet. You know, sales people are going to take a, you know, people on contingent income, they're going to take a hit. Um, our wealth, you know, the stock market, you know, plummeting like this, um, when the stock mar market declines, we feel, you know, like we're less wealthy. Mm -hmm. We're only really less wealthy when you, you know, cash those in, right? Right. You know, right now they're paper losses, but if you sell, you lock in those losses. So I would advise people don't sell, but I'm not a financial advisor. So, mm -hmm. but uh, I do think you know there'll be a sharp rebound once this you know we turn the corner. From a fundraising perspective, though, I think fundraisers have to recognize the very natural ways that we fundraise in the past: the galas, the auctions, the dances, the dance marathon that our students were about to have. Um, the, the many races in support of breast cancer and the walkathons, all those are being canceled and or radically reduced, right? Yes. And so those annual fund type fundraisers are going to asymptotically approach zero as they are structured. Right. Face to face fundraising, so if you're my major gift prospect and I want to set an appointment with you, are you gonna take that appointment? Only if I can slide the check six feet across the table. Right, right, right yeah. <laughs> you know, so if I'm a good donor, I might say, yeah, I'll send you a wire transfer. We don't need it. Or we can talk by phone, right, or right. Skype or Zoom. But, you know, the natural s sources of solicitation, the techniques of solicitation, are going to be tougher, more remote, and we know that a lot of fundraising is based on relationships, you know. And if I'm a donor, I'm probably not going to see you, whether you're the president of the organization, the CEO, the VP for development, a board member. Right. So, you know, so I think charities need to kind of anticipate that, understand that, be empathetic. But they also need to create a linkage with their donors and their constituents 
primarily going to have to be online, right? And so how do we do that in an efficacious manner and a respectful manner? And when we're soliciting, recognizing that if half my net worth just disappeared, even though it's a paper loss, I still feel less wealthy and I still feel less able to write you a big check. I may feel less wealthy such that I don't want to write any checks right now. I want to see how low do we go. You know, Patrick, that's, that's a great point, and your research has shown consistently over the decades, it's not just the dollars that I have, it's the dollars that I think I have right. at any given moment based on a wide range of economic data I hear, especially the stock market. Right. Uh, and if you could expand on that a little more as fundraisers are thinking about their donors, you make a great point uh, that certain of our neighbors in certain jobs, certain economic classes are getting hit much harder as they lose their jobs and see their hours reduced. But even that, say, white collar person who's able to work from home and is still drawing the normal paycheck, might be circling the wagons financially, right. at least for the short term. Again, help fundraisers understand that mentality people can have. Absolutely, so during the uh, high-tech bubble collapse, mm -hmm. um, you know, I talked- 2000, some, late 1990s. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so one of our Board of Visitors members at the time, uh, Paul Comstock, was a advisor to High Net Worth Households at the time, and he talked about a client who lost half of his value you know, at least based on the stock market. And this guy went into a mental funk and stopped socializing, stopped donating, stopped doing everything. And Paul said, look, X, yeah. you can spend as much as you want, as fast as you want for the rest of your life and you will never run out of money. But what he saw was that his poker chips were half as tall as they used to be. Yeah. And he went into kind of a, you know, build a wall with a deep, high wall, deep moat, you know, moat around it right. and went into a very protectionist mode. And I'm not saying everyone's doing that, but uh, if you've gone to Kroger's or uh, other stores, I mean, what you see is that people are being polite. No one took anything out of my cart. Right. But at the same time, the shelves are kind of bare in places. And I think people are kind of circling the wagons a little bit in that regard. And I think... You know, I think the concern I have is that some people may liquidate their assets now and lock in a much lower um, level of wealth, and then for the rest of their life, they're, they're spending and donating out of that. And others will just be so concerned about how low will this go and how fast will it take to recover, and they just want to see where the bottom is before they start doing anything. And I think that's not an irrational response. You know, Patrick, one thing you mentioned uh, just a few moments ago as well was that this is unprecedented. We can learn from the previous research on what happens during economic downturns and fundraising, but there's so much unique yeah. to this virus that we can't always apply those learnings from the past to what's going to happen today. That said, certainly I think most, if not all, fundraisers understand in this very short term, things are going to be tight as people are circling the wagons, whether they have less money or think they have less money or some combination of the, of, of the two. In the past, how soon has given, giving come back after these economic slowdowns? Yeah, so Bill, great question. You know, one of the things that we see is that philanthropy is really a core American value. And it's not that it doesn't exist in other countries, but I'm just talking about in our in our economy. I mean, what we see is that many do continue to give during recessions, and some lean in, right? Some lean in and give above and beyond, knowing that others are even more adversely affected. On the other hand, I think, given all the uncertainty, the uncharted nature of this, I think it's probably reasonable to assume that a lot of philanthropy is going to come to a bit of a standstill for a while. And uh, I think it's on the part of the charities to continue to communicate with their donors, with their constituents, let them know about their needs, right? Because some charities, you know, their needs are ongoing. Others, they are going to be in much greater need than they ever have been, right? And so uh, how do you communicate that? How do you communicate that in a way that doesn't convey panic but conveys the true need? How do you communicate that in a way that says, look, our doors are open and we're serving people. Um, there are more people who can't prepare meals. There are more people who can't you know, go to the store or go to the restaurant. We, they need our help. 
and we can't guarantee this is going to happen again, but when the Great Recession hit in September right. of 2008, yes, fewer households gave, but a significant number of households still donated, right. albeit at lower amounts. Again, we can't guarantee that's going to happen again, but that did happen when the Great Recession hit, which right. happened suddenly, a Sunday right. night in September. Suddenly the economy goes down the drain, where this has been a little bit more gradual, two to three weeks, not one day. Um, and so we can be hopeful that uh, households will still donate if nonprofits are staying in touch. Right. There may be certain donors that you can uh, approach and say, can you please make a special gift during this time? Uh, and that might be a strategy you want to uh, attempt. Online right now, great time to be telling your stories. Uh, you can always do that even when you're not making the ask. We should be doing that all the time anyway, now more than ever to stay in front of our donors. Uh, online fundraising, uh, to uh, take advantage of those opportunities, especially when those gifts are coming directly to you as opposed through Facebook or others where you can't receive the donors' names. Uh, all of these strategies now, uh, unusual strategies for an unusual time, uh, and the Fundraising School is gonna continue to be your career-long colleague. We invite you to stay in touch with us on Twitter and on Facebook, uh, on our email and on our website. We're gonna be having free webinars for you on Fridays. Stay tuned for those details where you're gonna be able to interact, where you're gonna be able to ask questions and uh, share information with each other. Worry, commiserate, share your stress with one another. Uh, and we're gonna be having guests that uh, can give you expert information during this time. Our website, philanthropy.iupui.edu forward slash the fundraising school. And the fundraising school is what you can enter again to find us on Twitter and on Facebook. With Dr. Patrick Bruni, this is Bill Stanjakevich, and you've been listening to the first day from the fundraising school. Music